Why is this couple smiling? Perhaps they found hope, meaning, and purpose in the book of Revelation. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a lonely man on a distant island received a remarkable vision. Some readers have been frightened by his vision, but many more have found in it the hope, meaning, and purpose they were looking for. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. John Pauline and Dr. Graham Bradford. Welcome to Revelation, Hope, Meaning, Purpose. I'm John Pauline. And I'm Graham Bradford. And uh, Graham, why don't you just take a moment and summarize our previous program? Sure. John, last time we dealt with the safeguards of how to study this book and make sure you keep on track. And we also spent some time on how Jesus gave a sermon on the end of the world, which reached not only from the days of his time, right through history, right until he returns at the end of the world. And the book of Revelation is really an unfolding of this sermon. And that means that it has, gives hope, meaning and purpose to every generation of Christians, and even more so as we get towards the end of history. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember we also talked a little bit about the issue of persecution, uh, how ancient Christians uh, would have been affected by neighbors and others who might turn them in and uh, they might suffer imprisonment, sometimes uh, even death. And we yeah. explored uh, how, how God relates to some of those things. Yeah. I think one thing we came up with was the idea that uh, learning to trust God Mm. becomes really, really critical. It's, it's, mm. it's the view that you have of God that determines how you can handle suffering when it comes. If you can see light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. and if, you can, if it makes sense and you can see some purpose, you can put up with an awful lot more, can't you? You really can. You see, here's the thing. It is the conviction of those who wrote the New Testament that the clearest picture of God a person can get is the picture that they saw when a man named Jesus came to this earth. And what a difference it made. Mm -hmm. It made all the difference, didn't it? And that's what our program is about today. Absolutely. God okay. stepped into history through Jesus Christ and that makes a lot of difference. Well, let's begin <clears throat> by taking a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It's the very mm -hmm. first verse in the book. Okay. It says here in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. I'd like to note a number of things in that text. Uh, first of all, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say the revelation of Middle Eastern oil. It, it doesn't say the revelation of Armageddon. Uh, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you study this book of Revelation, you don't get a clearer picture of Jesus you probably haven't interpreted the book correctly. And that's often been the case, hasn't it? It's been a happy hunting ground for all sorts of wild, sensational mm -hmm. theories. Yeah. If we stay on track with the book's own introduction, mm. I think we're safer. And this word revelation comes from a Greek word, apocalypsis, from which we get the word apocalypse. And uh, it's actually a combination of two Greek words, uh, sort of take the cover off. I imagine somebody in the kitchen, there's something good smelling there, and you take the cover off the pot mm. to see what's inside. Mm. In a sense, the book of Revelation takes the cover off mm. Jesus. It gives us a picture of Jesus we would never have had otherwise. Mm. Uh, otherwise, in the New Testament, Jesus is a human being who walks this earth. Revelation opens up a more cosmic picture. And particularly of who Jesus this is. very first scene we're going to look at shortly, where we see Jesus in a way we've never seen him before mm -hmm. revealed. And it's exciting. Yes. It, it sets the tone for mm -hmm. the rest of the book. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Now, one thing we talked about a little bit last time was the idea of the authorship of the book, mm -hmm. that uh, the book of Revelation is written by a man named John, who uh, most people think was a disciple of Jesus. And uh, this man, John, receives a vision from heaven. So in this verse, you see God giving something to Jesus, Jesus passing it on to John, and then John writes it down for the church. So there's a chain of revelation coming here. This is not just a human book, mm. but it's a book that is designed to uh, tell us more about God and his perspective on things. And this is so important because when we later on talk in this series, we talk in terms of uh, John did this, John did that, but really it's Jesus 
speaking right. through John, and we must make that clear. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I'd like to see verse 1 uh, just one more time, if we could, uh, because in that verse it makes a very interesting comment. It says that he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Now, translators often try to be helpful. This time it wasn't so helpful. This made it known is actually a technical term in the Greek language. It is a term for signify, to describe the future in terms of symbols, mm. you see? So this is a very technical term. The book of Revelation is signified. It is symbolized. In other words, don't take it too literally. Mm. As you're reading through, there's some amazing stories here, some, some beasts with seven heads and ten horns. There's some scary imagery. I bet really? you've never seen a, uh, an animal out in the Australian outback with seven heads and ten Not horns, Not even in Australia. No. Nor you, New York City either. Yeah, Australia <laughs> does have some strange animals there. Big grasshoppers. Really. <laughs> uh, we like the koalas a little better than the grasshoppers. But anyway, uh, the book of Revelation is using some of these strange creatures as symbols. Mm -hmm. So, as you're working through the book of Revelation, you want to understand, what is this pointing to? The literal language is pointing to something else. It's pointing mm -hmm. beyond itself. Mm -hmm. And as you study Revelation, uh, you want to give careful attention to that. What I like, John, is the things that matter most are clear. Mm -hmm. It can be understood. The clue comes within the Scripture itself. You don't have to reach out and speculate and superimpose it. The mm -hmm. things that matter are really clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'd mm -hmm. like to direct our attention now to a few verses just beyond this because in verses 4 to 6 of chapter 1, it, uh, how shall we put it, it tells in plain language, perhaps the only time in the book where the language is quite plain, it tells us what the book is about. Mm -hmm. uh, Revelation 1 verse 4, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood, and He has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father, to Him be glory and power forever and ever. You remember at the close of the last program, we highlighted that point that uh, through Jesus Christ, uh, people are elevated as kings and priests. Kings uh, were the highest status in the political realm in the ancient world. Mm. Priests had the highest status in the religious realm. Mm. And I have learned uh, through experience that as one begins to realize the way God looks at us, the way that God thinks of us, it can help to build one's uh, v sense of value. We are so precious in the mm -hmm. eyes of God. Mm -hmm. We put too low a price on ourselves. We really do. That's right. In God's eyes, everybody mm -hmm. is somebody. That's right. And I love mm -hmm. that. I love that. Now, an interesting thing that I would point out in these three verses, Revelation 1, 4 through 6, is there's three threes in this text which is very interesting. First of all, it says to the one who is and was and is to come. And uh, most uh, scholars take that as a reference to uh, God the Father, to the, the great uh, transcendent God. Um, then it says, from the one who is, was, and is to come, that's a three, and the seven spirits before his throne and Jesus Christ. So you have three persons, all right? God communicates to us through the book of Revelation, but that communication is coming from three persons, uh, which uh, Christians, I think, have generally called God the Father, uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is one God. Uh, Christians agree with their Jewish friends and their Muslim friends. There is one God. Uh, we're not talking about multiple gods. Uh, the, the pagans believed in multiple gods. But this one God has come to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's kind of a mystery. I, even in saying it, I'm thinking, oh, man, yeah. that, that's, that, that splits my head down the I've middle. I've often said it's not contrary to human logic, it's mm -hmm. over and above. Yeah. Uh, if we had made up a religion, we would uh -huh. make up a religion different, wouldn't we? Yeah. That here is something that is over and above human understanding. Yeah. yeah. But then there's a third three in verses four to six, and that is that Jesus Christ is the one who loves us, the one who freed us, from our sins by His blood, and He has made us kings and priests. So you have uh, a trinity of persons, 
and then you have a trinity of actions, and these are the actions of Jesus. So the book of Revelation sees Jesus as a high and exalted person. Who was this Jesus? Hmm. This Jesus was a human being who walked on this earth. He got sweaty. He got tired. He got uh, dirty. Hmm. I mean, imagine he felt pain. Walking uh, five miles or, or, or ten kilometers or something like that, yeah. and you're walking alongside, mm. and you know there's a bit of a sniff of uh, body odor or something. Are these people likely to say this must be God? Mm. No. The Book of Revelation is making an incredible claim that this man who walked the earth, mm. this man who was known and touched and mm. felt, this man was actually the great God of the universe. And it blows you away. Yeah. You say, why would he bother? Why mm -hmm. would he care for us enough? And one of the things we want to do mm -hmm. in this program is, is examine that claim. Mm -hmm. Does it have historical validity? Mm -hmm. Did Jesus actually exist? Mm -hmm. um, was he what Christians claimed him to be? Is the Bible reliable in exactly. what it says about him? Exactly. Yeah. But before we do that, I want to remind us of a text that we looked at briefly in the last program, and that is Revelation 1, 9, and 10. And I'll just summarize. John is on the island of Patmos, and he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And, and that text inspired me one day when I was on the island of Patmos. Mm. Let's take a look. Okay. I'm standing on an ancient road here on the Isle of Patmos, and not far from the cave where the Orthodox Church believes that John received the vision of Revelation. He tells us that I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It was not far from this very place that John received the vision that became the heart of the book of Revelation. Someone was telling me when they saw that that it might be a lot of fun to run up and down that road on a motorcycle. I think people do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I suspect that they do. Yeah. But uh, let's put up a map once more so people can locate where this is. You can see the island of Patmos is off the coast of what we would today call Turkey. And this book of Revelation was written initially to churches in seven cities in the western part of Asia Minor. It's because of those churches and because yeah. of Patmos that we have this magnificent book. And this book reveals Jesus in a way we've never seen him before. It is an unveiling of Jesus. And coming up after the break, we're going to have the second half of the chapter dealing with the first vision. John was amazed when he saw Jesus as he is in this vision. Coming up straight after the break. is one of the most incredible visions ever recorded in Scripture. Here we see Jesus revealed as never before. John, I think I'll read it here, Revelation chapter 1, mm -hmm. and it's verse 13 uh, through to verse 16. It talks here, it says, And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest, his head and hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flaming, a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance." Wow. John felt a bit overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he fell down. This is Jesus as he's never seen him before. You know, what, what a picture of Jesus it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at this, this artist impression here of what was really happening. Someone working with me on this uh, series said, you know, that's not the sort of Jesus I think I could hug. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And someone else said to me, but look, look at his eyes. You know, they don't look friendly. Mm -hmm. But in his feet, but this is all symbolic, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. but it has meaning yeah. and it is relating to all that's going to come later on through Revelation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. So um, every part of this is of great significance as Jesus relates to his church. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. well, what interests me here is you have Jesus in the context of these candlesticks. And uh, this is an immediate reminder of the Old Testament temple uh, back in, uh, in ancient times, ancient Israel and uh, contemporary Judaism at the time that John uh, was writing. And uh, the candlestick was part of the temple service there. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting, for uh, a number of years I had uh, gone with tour groups to Laodicea, one of the seven churches in Asia Minor. If you go to Turkey today and go to ancient Laodicea, uh, ten years ago it was simply farmer's fields. Mm. Uh, there were three huge depressions there that were said to be ancient theaters or amphitheaters and uh, it was clear that a vast city was there. You walk across the farmer's field and you see bits of pottery and bits of marble and so mm. forth. You have two feet down. Mm. This is incredible city. I've had the same experience. Yeah. You say, why doesn't somebody do some work here? Yeah. And sure yeah. enough, uh, the Turkish mm. government has been doing that very recently. And be commended. Yes, mm. and uh, you had a chance to see that for the first time just mm. uh, a little while ago. I was absolutely ago. blown away, yeah. absolutely blown away. Yeah. That's right. Mm. Well, one of the things we found there in Laodicea was a description of the Jewish candlestick right on one of the columns. Why don't we have a look at that? Okay. I'm sitting in the central square, the marketplace of ancient Laodicea. And uh, among the ruins that we find here is an interesting column. And on this column, you see a seven branch candlestick. You can probably follow my finger just there. You see the seven branch candlestick and it's superimposed by a cross. One of the special themes of our series is how much Christianity is related to Judaism. In fact, the two did not start out at all as separate religions, uh, but Christianity was an expansion and extension of Judaism as understood by the people of that time. You cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand its heritage, unless you understand the sanctuary themes, unless you understand the Old Testament, the, the scriptures of Judaism. And so this has got to be a crucial part of everything we do when we're studying the book of Revelation. Yeah, John, that is surprising, isn't mm -hmm. it? The candlesticks, a Christian symbol of a cross together, you know, it, it is surprising. Well, uh, some people would be uh, perhaps immediately repulsed by that and say, you know, what do these two have to do with each other? Yeah. And uh, so I invited a scholar of Judaism to talk to us a little bit about that. What, what is the relationship uh, between Christianity and Judaism as it was back in John's day? Okay, he's one and of your colleagues. He's a colleague of mine named Jacques Ducan. Okay. And uh, let's listen to what he has to say. Okay. To speak about uh, the Jewish character of the New Testament faith is certainly not a new assignment because for the first time we had this defined by Apostle Paul himself. I read in the book of Acts in chapter 24 that Paul dis identified himself as the one who worships the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the Torah and in the prophets and I have hope in God, which the Jews themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So he was just here describing, uh, the Apostle Paul, the particular connection which relates his faith to uh, the Hebrews uh, of, the, of, the, of ancient Israel and also the Jewish contemporary. And indeed, when you uh, explore that connection, you realize that it is much more connected, much more serious than we, we think. I mean, people are questioning that, but uh, the, 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 the New Testament faith is enrooted in the Hebrew Scriptures. It defines itself as a faith on the Hebrew Scriptures, believing in the Torah, the law, and the, and the prophets, believing in the, same, in the same faith, the God of hope, the same hope, the God of resurrection, and also uh, uh, identifying uh, their faith as a faith which is uh, made of keeping the law of God and at the same time believing in the God who is going to save mankind. Uh, and indeed, when you read the, the scriptures, uh, whether it is uh, what it has been called the New Testament, whether it is the Gospels or even go to the book of Revelation, 
you realize that it is nurtured by that particular connection. The book of Revelation, for instance, starts with a beatitude, like uh, uh, those beatitudes we find in the, in the, in the Psalms, or uh, the, the same beatitude which ends the book of, of, of Daniel, blessed is he. S and also when you read the, the book of Revelation, you realize that the whole book is animated, is nurtured, fed by many uh, new, uh, uh, allusions to the so-called Old Testament. We have about 2,000 allusions to the Old Testament. This is the most uh, Hebrew text, the most Hebrew book of the New Testament. Of course, uh, when we uh, read uh, today, when we, look, when we consider what Christianity is and what Judaism is, we tend to think that we have two different faiths. But at that time, the early Christians did not identify themselves as a, a new faith. It was an emphasis, it was a, a, a development of the, uh, an expansion, let's say a blossoming of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, but it was not something, something new. So uh, again, to come back to the, what the Apostle Paul says, uh, uh, not only he refers to the scriptures here, um, uh, but he refers to his roots, to the God of my fathers, so you have the same history, the same roots, believing all things which are written in the, the law and in the prophets, a way of re referring to the, the Old Testament. I have hope in God, which the Jews themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So he has the same past, the same future, and then also the same point of connection that is the Hebrew scriptures. This is what, how at that time the New Testament faith was defined, and uh, uh, we could also say the same today if we want to be consistent. That was really important. Mm -hmm. You know, many people would never appreciate what he said, and it seems like these people to whom John originally wrote must have really known their Old Testament. This vision of Jesus that you read is just riddled with quotations from the Old Testament. Mm. But there's even more, a very shocking, surprising thing. Mm -hmm. We visited a pagan temple in uh, modern-day Turkey. Look what we found out. Mm -hmm. I'm standing in front of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, I guess it's not one of the seven wonders of the modern world. What happened here and why is it important and where did it go? Well, this was the Temple of Artemis, which was the first major temple in the ancient world to be built entirely of marble. It was huge. It was the centerpiece of uh, worship here in Ephesus. And uh, it actually is a pointer to something even bigger. You see, there was an overarching goddess in the ancient world that transcended just Asia or Ephesus, and that goddess was named Hecate. Hecate uh, could be called different names in different places. Here in Ephesus, she was Artemis, uh, the goddess of the Ephesians. In Rome, she might be Diana. In uh, heaven, she would be Selene or Luna. So Hecate could take many different names and uh, take on different forms. What is significant about her is that she was called the first and the last. She was called the goddess of revelation. She had the keys of heaven and hell. She could travel up to heaven, travel down to hell, come back and tell everybody here what that was all about. Why is this significant? for the book of Revelation, particularly chapter 1, because in chapter 1 of Revelation, John describes Jesus as the first and the last, as the holder of the keys of heaven and hell, as the one who is the one who brings the revelation. And the question arises, why would John use language that refers to a pagan goddess and describe Jesus in that way? Why would Jesus want to be described in that way? And I think the answer is simply this. The principle that you find throughout the Bible, God meets people where they are. In other words, he uses their time, their place, their circumstances, their beliefs, their language, in order to bring them a little bit closer understanding of what God is like. In this particular case, what would the message be? The message would be 
that whatever the pagan of Ephesus saw in Hecate, in Artemis, the things that they hoped to receive, if they really wanted those things, if they really wanted to have their place, they would look to Jesus. Very interesting. I think that might be a surprise to, uh, to some of our viewers uh, because it raises the important question, you know, why all these things? Uh, many people feel Christianity and Judaism, you can't put them together. Mm. Certainly uh, pagan goddess, what does that have to do with anything? But apparently when God reveals himself, mm. He meets people where they are. Mm. He comes to the place mm. where they are. Mm. And uh, that means that he is deeply interested in being understood. Mm. And one of the reasons we haven't understood the book of Revelation is we haven't taken the time to understand it in the original context, mm. in the original place. Mm. And see, that brings us to the point uh, for the second half of our program today. Because when God said, I want to go the full distance, I want to go to the ultimate place of communicating who I am. Mm. He decided to send his son as a Amazing. human being Amazing. to bring him to this earth, yeah. to have him walk to this earth, yeah. to possibly be misunderstood as just a human being Amazing. in order to show us what God is like yeah. after the break. Okay. back. We promised to talk uh, a little bit more about uh, Jesus' extraordinary claims. And uh, Graham, uh, why don't you take the lead on this one? Sure. John, right here in the text, it says that Jesus said that he is the first, the last, the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever and hold the keys of death and Hades. Is there a more important verse anywhere in scripture than this one? He is the one who holds our destiny. If this is true, what he claims, we have hope, meaning and purpose for the future, don't we? If he wasn't whom he claims, we're in trouble, deep trouble. Let's have a look at the other claims that Jesus gave because he did make a significant number of claims, didn't he? Okay, let's just have a look at them and we'll see them. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, to have pre-existed. He said before Abraham was, I am. He also said that angels obey him. And he went on to make other claims as well. He said he could foretell the future of this world, which we saw in our previous program, didn't we? Mm -hmm. He said he could forgive sin. And he said, if you kill me, I will raise myself back to life again. He claimed that he would raise himself back to life. Now, what would you think of me if I said that? John, you kill me, but in three days, I'll raise myself back to life. What would you think? I would think you'd lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This man made extravagant claims. Now, if he was whom he claimed to be, we have a hope and a purpose and a meaning in life. So if, let, let me get what you're saying here. You are saying that uh, if one buys into the claims mm -hmm. that Jesus has made, if, if you take these seriously, then it's going to make all the difference in our lives today? Oh, all the difference, all the yeah. difference. You know, because he says here in this text here, mm -hmm. I am alive and live alive at this moment forever. He said, I am alive and live forever and ever. I hold the key of death and Hades. In other words, because he lives, we will live too if we should die. Mm -hmm. That's precious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What a difference it makes in how we live. So yeah. this man, the claims he makes, you know, are worth investigating. At least a person ought to spend some time thinking about these claims because if they're true, then life has meaning, hope for the future. So we're going to look now at this man, Jesus Christ, and we're going to say now, John, let's look at it as an historian would look. Let's look okay. at it from pure history. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you, how do you know there was such a person as Alexander the Great? You know, have you ever seen him? Have you reached out and touched him? Yeah, how do you know he existed? Maybe it's a, a myth. Well, it's sort of a no, no, and no. Uh, I think probably part of the reason that uh, that we would think he existed is because he's in the history books. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you never met him. No, 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 definitely not. Yeah. So in a, in a way, you're trusting somebody else's word. Mm -hmm. Okay. And alongside what you said, I would also say that if he never existed, 
he, we leave a huge hole in history because who conquered the Persians? Who set up the, mm. the Grecian Empire? Yeah. I mean, history suddenly has a great gap, doesn't it? Well, it was incredible. Uh, you have this huge Persian Empire, and Alexander uh, starts out with this little army, and about five years later, uh, there's no more Persian Empire, and he's off in India somewhere. It's, a, yeah. it's an incredible story, but the whole world shifted, and mm. if Alexander didn't exist, then how did right. that happen? And if I were to ask you, how do you know there was such a person as Adolf Hitler? Did mm. you ever meet him, talk to him? How do you know? Well, I think when my mom lived in Berlin in the 1930s, she said he visited somebody across the street once. So that's a, a bit of a word of mouth uh, on that one. But still, I think that there's a lot of trust in what others have done. But I, I, I like the point you're making. Uh, you have to have an Alexander the Great or history doesn't make any sense. Mm. Even though maybe there's only a handful of ancient uh, evidences that he existed. Mm. And for Hitler. We would have people alive today yeah. who ha would have had close contact with him. Yeah. We have all the evidence of World War II mm -hmm. and all the graves and the battlefields. Yeah. And if this man was just a myth, mm -hmm. then you've got a lot of explaining to do with history. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have in the first century, beginning of the first century, there was no such person in this world as a Christian. Christians mm -hmm. just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. By the end of that first century, the Christian faith had spread right throughout the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Now something happened during that century to cause the Christian church to come into existence. Mm -hmm. We have evidence that, that men and women were going up and down that little land of Palestine saying, Jesus Christ is alive. We have seen him put to death, but he's alive. Mm -hmm. Now, if he never existed, I mean, could I go up and down this country talking about a man who'd been put to death and was alive and people just accept it? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't happen, would it? No, I don't think you so. You cannot account for the rise of the Christian church in the first century in a tiny little land of Palestine if this man never existed. He was put to death in a very public way. There's no question he was put to death. People back there don't question. People often today question. But back there, it was a public event. He was put to death. Now, what evidence do we have for the resurrection of Jesus? That's the point. Is he alive today as the text here claims? Here we're looking at real history. If we were just going to history as an historian would, or maybe even better, if I was just weighing things up in a court of law, like a lawyer making a case, we would say we have more evidence for the existence of Jesus than, say, even Hitler or Alexander the Great. And I believe it tests our honesty because really you look at the details as given in Scripture regarding the life of Jesus. It wasn't long ago they found the family grave of Caiaphas, 